All right, so welcome everybody. Uh, we'll begin with just uh, our purification ritual. And so purification of what? I explain it, I try to explain it a little bit differently each time, each week as we come to it. Uh, but there are what are known as the three uh, unwholesome roots in the practice. They're also known by other names, the three root kalesas, and there are other names as well. But the three unwholesome roots are greed, aversion, and ignorance. And sometimes we say delusion. And sometimes a suitable word for that would be confusion. So greed is kind of a neediness or uh, an emphasized feeling of wanting. Uh, wanting lots of different things to try and satisfy you in terms of sense pleasures, kind of gratification, a feeling of accomplishment that one gets from possessing nice things. Um, nothing wrong with that, but when we take it to an extreme, it can become problematic. So greed is one of those uh, unwholesome roots. Another is aversion. Aversion can take the form of ill will or anger or hatred or disliking, wanting to be separated from. Again, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be separated from illness or pain, but sometimes we take it to the extreme again and we want to be separated from you know, maybe people of a different religion or people of a different race or people of a different ideology and that can begin to develop into unwholesome emotions, unwholesome mind states. So those are the first two. And then uh, the third one, ignorance, uh, sometimes called delusion. Also the suitable word is confusion. Ignorance is really checking out from our experience. It's sort of a choice to not pay attention to what's going on uh, internally, to not pay attention to the craving, to the greed, to the aversion, to not pay attention to the fact that many of the things we go after in life are really unsatisfying and so maybe not worth going after. Um, so this is what delusion is or ignorance is. It has nothing to do with uh, your intellectual capacity, um, and it has everything to do with just how much you're willing to look at with regard to your own experience in accordance with the Dhamma practice. So we look at that, we look at that in our purification ritual and we just see it, well is there any of that that's manifesting in me right now that I would be able to identify objectively, no blame here, just noticing, oh yeah, this is a part of my consciousness in this moment, or that's a part of my consciousness in this moment. And so by noticing this and being objective, we can say, well, I understand that these are unwholesome roots, that these can branch out into other afflictive emotions or difficult emotions. And so let me see if I can put them down. Let me see if I can just let go at least for a period of time, and then work on myself in a different way. So with that in mind, we take a look at what those, uh, what derivatives of those three unwholesome roots, greed, aversion, uh, ignorance, delusion, confusion, we look at any of that which is present, and we create the wholesome intention to put that down so that we can work on ourselves in a positive way. And so with that, I'll sound the bell. Let there be peace. Let there be peace. Let there be peace. And there is peace. Thank you all for being here. But if you want to take a minute to prepare for the meditation, however you'd like to be, lying down or sitting or kneeling. And of course, as we said, you don't have to stay in any one position for the entire meditation practice. If you get uncomfortable, you are very welcome to move. And
and in so doing you can eliminate conflict in the body um, at different times in our practice it can be helpful to try and kind of tough out the pain or the discomfort and to work through it um, there's certainly a place for that but for this basic meditation we're really trying to um, uh, we're really trying to remove conflict from the body so that we can work with what's going on in the mind at this point in time. So we'll just get comfortable, find balance in your body so that both sides are doing about the same thing, that your weight is evenly distributed on both sides of your body. Just find a comfortable way for your hands to rest, your back, uh, should be straight, relatively straight, but not rigid or stiff. Just straight in a way that allows you to breathe freely and openly. Your eyes are closed softly just to eliminate the visual distractions of being in the room. You let your breath flow naturally, not manipulating it in any way. It is sometimes more comfortable to let your chin tuck forward ever so slightly if you're sitting or kneeling. This can take some of the strain off the back of the neck and the upper back. So with all this, we have a body that is an, in peace and without great conflict. And so now we'll be able to start the practice. I will ring the bell. And when the bell goes into silence, I'll begin to guide us through. Follow the sound of the bell. Follow it into silence. The bell is a warm welcome to turn your senses inward, to become aware of your presence in your own body. And this is something that many of us don't do regularly. When we turn the senses inward, we find we are able to let go of all of those exterior activities that are going on, the noises, the different sights, the things that are occurring around us. We're able to let go of those quite naturally and quite easily and just turn the senses inward, become aware of that sense of presence, Become aware of that feeling of stability and peacefulness that exists naturally within the body and within the mind when it is at rest. We become aware of that feeling. We also notice that there's a quality of reliability to it, that it is always available to us whenever we look. And it is something that we can count on for our practice. So this is a very wonderful thing to be aware of. So with our awareness focused inward, aware of the body, aware of our presence within it, we establish awareness and together let's bring that awareness up to the top of the head and to the area of the scalp. Okay, and with our awareness focused here on the scalp, we simply open up to any physical sensations that are manifesting themselves in the present moment. So we're not looking for anything miraculous. We're just looking for what is true in the present moment. And so these sensations might show up as temperature sensations. And sometimes those we notice are internal Sometimes temperature sensations are external to the body. Sometimes sensations show up as an awareness of air movement as it moves across the hair or the skin. Sometimes sensations pre that present themselves as sensations on the surface of the skin. 
There can be tickles or itches or pulsations. And so we're just here with awareness, open, attentive, objective, noticing whatever is there, noticing how sensations have a tendency to arise and pass away, arise and pass away. And with our awareness still focused in the scalp, if we notice any tension anywhere in the area of the scalp, we can simply release that. It's very easy to do. Just become aware of the tension in the scalp and allow it to leave the body. Give it permission to go. Allow it unconditional freedom. Let it leave the body unconditionally. And then notice the feeling that remains. There is an enhanced sense of stability and peacefulness. And then we can continue to observe the sensations in the scalp as they arise and pass away. Now from here, from the scalp, we can bring our awareness downward. It's helpful to try and really feel the movement of awareness as it moves from the scalp downward into the forehead. Sometimes we can detect a sort of warm flow of awareness. So we follow that into the forehead. From there, we let it spread out into the temples. We let it descend down through the eyebrows and into the eyes. And then we focus awareness here in these four parts. Once again, just noticing sensations, whatever is here. So there are sensations of temperature, air movement, and sensations on the surface of the skin. If there's tension, oftentimes the brow is furrowed. Sometimes there's tightness in the temples. Sometimes the eyebrows are raised, or maybe they're kind of flexed downward in a frown of some sort. Or sometimes there's tension in the eyes, we squint. So anywhere we discover this tension, we just release it. It's a wonderful thing to notice it because we can just smile and let it go. Noticing the tension, we smile and let it go. And so now from the temples, we can begin to guide the awareness downward into the ears. Again, be aware of the movement of awareness, the feeling as it moves down into the ears. I'll start to name some of these parts of the body and as I do, just follow that same process of observing sensations and immediately releasing tension. So awareness is in the ears and from here, we guide it forward into the face We feel it moving through the cheekbones. We feel it moving forward through the face. And then from the eyes, we can feel the awareness drifting down, passing through the nose, into the lips and mouth and chin. And so we are aware of the sensations in all of these areas. And we're letting the tension go as soon as we notice. So if your jaws are tight or your teeth are clenched, as soon as you notice, you just release. If your lips are pursed or there's tightness somewhere else in the face, as soon as you notice, just release. And you find yourself becoming ever more peaceful and stable, allowing tension to leave the body unconditionally And now from the chin, we'll move the awareness downward into the neck. Feel it flowing downward. Feel it in the front of the neck and the throat. And then we move around to the sides of the neck, feeling awareness spreading. Moving awareness to the back of the neck. Opening up to all of the different sensations temperature, air movement, sensations on the skin. And sometimes here, depending on how we're sitting or laying, 
we may feel contact between our neck and the chair or the cushion. So this is simply another sensation to be observed. In the observation of all sensations, we try to maintain a level of objectivity. So we're not here to judge what's a good sensation or a bad one, what's right or wrong. We're just observing as it is, whatever is presenting itself in the present moment. All we need to do is observe it. And we let go of tension simply because it's something that isn't needed at this time. It is a part of our experience that we can let go of and find increasing peacefulness. So now from the neck, we'll move our awareness again. We'll let it drop down into the shoulders. Let it spread out through the shoulders. Feeling those sensations. Again, here in the shoulders, there might be contact as a sensation between your shoulders and the chair or the cushion. There may also be the sensation of contact between your skin and your clothing. So these are things to look for and focus on momentarily if they're present. Allow the shoulders to drop if they're at all shrugged. And then from the shoulders, we can let the awareness move downward into the upper arms. And in the upper arms, we'll focus for a moment on the biceps or the front part. Sensations, tension, letting go. Rotating inward to the inside part of the upper arm. Sensations, tension, letting go. Moving to the backs or the triceps. Again, sensation tension, letting go. And then finally to the outside surface of the upper arms. Awareness of sensation, awareness of tension, letting go. And then from here, we allow the awareness to begin to move down through the elbow joints, feeling that soothing movement of awareness. This is the practice of samatha, which means calm abiding. Moving from the elbow joints down into the forearms. Just feel that soothing flow working its way down through the forearms into the wrists. And then once it's in the wrists, we feel it moving into the hands. And once it's in the hands, we begin to observe the different parts of the hands. We notice that each part has, in some cases, very different sensations. The heels of the hands and the palms of the hands. We can move around to the top surface of the hands. There are oftentimes differences in temperature. Sometimes the palms are perspiring to some degree. We spread our awareness through the thumbs and fingers, just observing. Nothing good or bad, nothing right or wrong, just what is. And then moving downward into the very tips of the fingers, we focus our awareness on the fingernails. And the fingernails are a very small part of the body the sensations there are very subtle. See if you can notice any sensations here in the fingernails. And then from here, we'll let go and we'll maintain a continuity of awareness as we make the move up to the top of the chest. And we can start by spreading awareness across the collarbones and then like a window shade, we can observe as the awareness flows downward through the chest, downward further all the way to the base of the sternum, observing those sensations and automatically letting the tension go. 
This is a wonderful habit we're developing. When awareness meets tension, our response is complete release. Complete release, setting ourselves free, creating peace, calm, harmony and stability in the body and the mind. And now moving through the rib cage, expanding outward, we bring the awareness up to the underarms and we start to guide it down through the sides of the body in a very loving, compassionate way, moving down all the way down till we reach the waist. And then here at the waist, we guide the awareness forward into the belly. And now for a few moments, just focus awareness on the belly. Become aware of all of the sensations in the belly at this time. Sometimes there's a sensation of rising and falling in the belly as the breath comes in and out. Sometimes there's a feeling of expansion and contraction or filling and emptying. So we observe, just observe. If there's tension in the belly, we release it. Let the belly relax. Oftentimes there is tension there and it's just a matter of noticing. And now we release the tension further calming and stabilizing the body and the mind. Now from the belly, we'll make the move around to the top of the back. So we'll maintain that continuity of awareness and we'll bring the awareness to the base of the neck in back. And then we let it begin to spread downward and outward through the shoulder blades through the upper third of the back. If there is discomfort here in the upper third of the back, <clears throat> which is very common, if there's discomfort, just notice that. Try to remain objective to it, not labeling it as a problem or a bad thing, but just note it, noticing discomfort as discomfort and see if you can expand your awareness, expand the awareness around the discomfort, and just allow the discomfort to be just as it is in this moment. You find that if you don't push against it with aversion, if you're not generating disliking or hatred or ill will toward the difficult sensations, that you're able to just allow those sensations to be there and give them all the space they need. Doesn't mean you have to condone the discomfort, it just means you're aware that it's there, but you're aware that your expansive awareness is big enough to allow it to be just as it is while your awareness continues. And then from here, we can move awareness downward a bit into the middle third of the back. Again, following that same process of objectively being aware. And just really allowing sensations to be whatever they are in this moment. That in itself cultivates great peacefulness. Not condoning, not pretending you like it just allowing it to be as it is without pushing against it. And then moving awareness downward one more time into the lower third of the back, observing here, aware of sensations, allowing the sensations that are there to be, and letting go of the tension around all of it. From the lower back now, we move awareness downward into the sit bones. Feel it flowing through the sit bones. And you may become aware of the feeling of contact. If you are sitting, you'll feel that contact, the feeling of bearing weight on your sit bones. 
just a sensation to be observed. If you're laying, you will also feel that feeling of contact, bearing weight in the sit bones. Be aware of the sensations. Move awareness through the hips as well. Let it continue to spread through the pelvis. Be aware of sensations and just let all that tension go. And then from the pelvis, we'll move awareness downward into the thighs. And the thighs are a larger muscle group, so we'll spend time working with sections of the thighs. First, just focus on the uppermost surface of the thighs. However, you're sitting or laying that top surface, aware, releasing, and then moving outward, rotating outward to the outer surface of the thighs. Again, just aware of sensations, letting go of tension, rotating once again to the lower surface or the underside of the thighs, observing no judgments of any kind, letting go. And then finally moving to the inner surface of the thighs, all the way up and down, just observing. These are the sensations, letting go of tension. And then now we guide the awareness through the knee joints. Again, try to stay with that awareness of the flow as it moves through. See if you can just stay in touch with that feeling of movement as awareness moves through from part to part, flowing through the knees, flowing downward further, feel it as it moves through the calves, as it fills the shins and moves downward toward the ankles, always letting go of tension, moving down through the ankles into the feet, and then spending some time investigating the different parts of the feet with their own unique sensations, the heels, then moving to the soles of the feet and observing, and then moving to the balls of the feet, again just observing, rotating around to the tops of the feet, and then finally moving downward into the toes. With awareness in the toes, we finally move down to the toenails themselves. And again, in this relatively small part of the body, we start to open up awareness. And sometimes it takes a little while. Just be aware, what are the sensations in my toenails? Maybe you feel a sensation in one or two nails. As you continue to observe, maybe you notice more. You know, whatever's there, you just observe. It's, it's objectively observed. It's okay, just as it is. Let the tension go if, it's, if any is there. And now we'll make a move, we'll bring the awareness once again up to the top of the head and to the area of the scalp. But this time I'd like to invite you to move your awareness down through your body at your own pace. So you can do this quickly if you'd like, or more slowly. But it might be helpful to bring awareness to a part of the body upon inhalation and then release tension in that same part upon exhalation. So you can do that in the scalp and then move downward into the face, repeating the process there and then moving into the back of the head and just moving down part by part. It's helpful to follow the same path and pattern that we follow together just so that no part is left out. This way you're more likely to remember them all. Just bring the awareness to them with the in-breath, release the tension with the out-breath. 
as you're noticing tension in the different parts of the body, notice if some of this tension was there previously when we began the practice and you let it go then and you're discovering it has returned. And we notice how that happens unconsciously, how tension just sort of seems to reappear. It comes back on its own. And this is one of the habits of the body and the mind working together. Whenever we have a challenging situation, something difficult or scary or painful, something that makes us mad, we respond emotionally, but we also respond physically by tensing up the body. There's tension in the body whenever there's a difficult emotion. And we let that emotion go, we let the thought go, we move on, but the tension often remains in the body. And it shows up again and again in these habitual spots. It's just like that's where it goes. And so we notice this and we can practice with it again and again, just releasing it, knowing this is the place where I habitually hold tension, in my jaws, in my shoulders, in my belly. We notice and we let go. We become aware and objectively we release. And in this way we begin to cultivate a new habit energy in the body which is to let go and to be free. So now once you've had a chance to move your awareness all the way through the body once again this is the first stage of our practice together, the samatha, calm abiding. And now we'll begin the second stage of the practice, which is anapanasati, awareness of respiration. So let's all bring our awareness together up to the base of the nose. There's a little patch of skin beneath the nostrils and above the upper lip. You can focus your awareness fully on that little spot. And then from there, you can expand your awareness a little bit further. Let it spread out into the rings of the nostrils. And then we'll go one step further still and expand that awareness into the nasal passages. So if you think about it, we've got this triangular area of the nose, in and around the nose. And we're just bringing all of our awareness to focus here awareness of movement of respiration. So as you breathe in, you're just aware you're breathing in. And as you breathe out, you're just aware that you're breathing out. But even this is such a unique and rare experience. Breathing in, I know I am breathing in. Breathing out, I know I am breathing out. And we continue to observe like this. You might notice that some in-breaths are a little longer and some are a little shorter. You might notice that sometimes more air moves through the left nostril or more air moves through the right nostril. Just aspects of respiration to be observed objectively. As you're breathing, as you're observing the in-breath, try to stay with it for its full duration. So not just the beginning, but staying with it. As it comes in, it fills the lungs, it slows. Then it pauses and at some point reverses direction and it becomes the out-breath. And then we stay with that for its full duration, with the out-breath following it as it comes in, as it slows eventually and pauses, then it becomes the in-breath. In this way we come, become aware of the continuous nature of the breath, the nature of the breath as a cycle we observe. And as we observe, we might become aware of some of the subtle sensations. There's a feeling of touch 
in the triangular area of the nose as the breath moves in and as the breath moves out. See if you can become aware of that feeling of touch. And as you do, you might notice subtleties within the touch. And sometimes that will be like a feeling of coolness as you're breathing in. You'll notice that in the nose a feeling of warmth comparatively as you're breathing out because of the inside temperature of the body being warmer than the air in the room. Sometimes when you breathe in, the air feels a little drier. And when you breathe out, it feels a little more moist. So these are aspects of the breath to be aware of along with, again, the duration of the breath, how deep is the breath, following the movement of the breath. And this is the second stage of meditation, anapanasati, awareness of the breath. And then we move into the third stage of meditation, which is vipassana, which just means insight. It means as we observe what is going on with the breath that we can become aware of reactions that are taking place within the body and the mind, of thoughts and reactions. And we can begin to work with these in a skillful way through observation. So right now as you're focused on your breath, Sometimes you'll become aware of a distraction in the form of a sound. You'll hear something in the room or on the road outside. The mind will move to that, <clears throat> moving away from awareness of the breath. The mind moves. And in the moment that you notice that, this is a very wonderful and very helpful moment because you now have the opportunity to guide the awareness back to the nose and to the breath. And so from this, we train ourselves to let go of distractions of sound. We train ourselves to return to the object of meditation, all with objectivity, without getting upset in any way, just being aware. <clears throat> Sometimes as we observe, we'll become aware of sensations in the body that are distracting. You know, we might feel a little ache or pain, soreness in the sit bones, could be anything. But this pulls the awareness away from the breath. And so at some point you'll notice this. And in that moment, you'll guide your awareness back to the breath. And just reestablish awareness. There is no problem with being distracted. Every time you notice is a victory. It strengthens your practice. You just bring awareness back. And maybe it stays there for only one or two breaths and then you have to do it again, but that's okay. This is the practice. And sometimes we'll notice how the mind just kind of sweeps us away in thought fantasies or memories or plans or just imagining something. If the mind moves away in distraction away from the breath, we bring our awareness to that and we return awareness to the triangular area of the nose. We let go of our reactions. We reestablish awareness. And we just stay with the breath again as long as we can until we notice it's moved and then we fix it again. So this is the practice, the third stage of the meditation, Vipassana or insight. Let's continue to practice this way together for just a few minutes, staying focused and letting go, returning to the breath just a few minutes together in silence, and then I'll sound the bell to end the meditation.
Great. Take a minute to come back to the room with your awareness. Feel free to stretch or stand. The tea is in the kitchen. If you're interested in tea, please help yourself. One of the things I think is interesting is to kind of take note of the way we feel at the moment that the bell rings to end the meditation practice. Because each time it seems a little different. Sometimes the bell will go off and I'll feel like, wow, I really would like to just keep going. I could do this for another half hour or longer. You know, sometimes I feel that way. Other times the bell will go off and it's like, oh, thank goodness. You know, it's like I couldn't take another minute. I think it's interesting to just be aware of that because it's it's the same practice, but whatever's going on in the mind and the body changes our relationship to that meditation practice. It's kind of a helpful thing to be aware of. The other thing that is helpful to be aware of is just the, the tone that we bring to this whole practice of meditation. Um, qualities of compassion, right? I mean, we're not, we, we, we're trying to cultivate objectivity and within objectivity that gives us the ability to be compassionate. We're not blaming ourselves or others. We're just aware of what's happening as it is. We're just accepting it as the reality of the present moment not condoning it, not condemning it. And so there's this quality of acceptance, this quality of compassion, this quality of objectivity. And out of that springs forth, you know, sometimes just a feeling of joyfulness. And it's neat to see how that works. Objectivity, non-judgmentalism, acceptance, compassion, self-kindness, all of that, out of that springs forth love, it springs forth joy, it's just kind of a neat thing. So that's part of our practice. If you're doing a meditation and you come out of it um, feeling uh, mad or uh, hostile or something like that, you know, then, then maybe that wasn't quite the right approach to the meditation. So. You know, this is really the fruit of the practice that we feel good about it, good about ourselves. And we also feel like we have enough left over to give to other people, you know, whether it's deep listening or compassionate presence with somebody without even saying a word. Sometimes people need that. But we find that we have that in ourselves and then we're able to give it. Not only are we able to give it, but we really like to, we really want to. It just feels so good to be able to help in any way possible. Just a smile any way possible. So, wonderful. Pardon me, I'm going to just take a sip here. Um, a couple things I'll share uh, just in announcements. Sometimes we go a little long at the end so I don't get a chance to share announcements. Um, we have gift certificates available now. If anybody is interested in those, um, uh, you can talk to me after if you're interested, but they're gift certificates for, you can do 25 or 50 or 75 or 100 or any number. Uh, but if you wanna give the gift of uh, the Dharma practice to somebody, sometimes a gift certificate like this is a good way to get somebody to come. You know, because you give it to them as a gift and so they're able to come and, and use it here and do some practice. So these are available if anybody's interested in one of these or several of these, you can just talk to me. Um, also, uh, I'm able to accept payments through PayPal now. I don't know how many of you have that, but you can... Uh, make payments for books or merchandise or gift certificates or even just contributions through PayPal. So if that is at all of an interest to you, you can talk to me about that as well. Um, and then the last thing is that uh, 
um, I changed my email address uh, a little bit. It was ken at stillknowing.org. Email address is now stillknowing at gmail.com. Um, so I just made that change. Uh, the other email that you often see things from me, I think I usually send the newsletter from my personal email, kebritzius at gmail.com. That's fine to use that too, but I just kind of wanted to bring it to your attention. That's the most up-to-date information on the back of tonight's handout. So that's what we have. Um, I'm also working on um, some Sunday classes uh, of some sort where maybe mid to late morning on Sunday, we would do some sort of a Dharma class along with a guided meditation like this. Um, so I'm working on developing that. I'm kind of setting the first of the year as sort of a goal for having a lot of these things ready to offer. Um, that and also uh, I had experimented a little bit with open meditation a few months ago. Open meditation is just where we open the center up and people can come in and just do self-guided meditation here. You just meditate on your own. Some people like, uh, well, some people don't have access to a real quiet space that's condu conducive to meditation. And so it can be helpful to have a place to come. And then also, I mean, there is a sort of sense of kind of the sacred here in this place where all we do is use it for meditation and mindfulness. And so sometimes it just feels good to do it in a place like this. So um, I'll be re, uh, uh, reopening for that um, after the first of the year. So I'll update people as that happens. But those are just some things we're working on. And I'm also really open to suggestions. If anybody has any ideas, hey, it would be cool if you did this or if you did that. I love to hear people's ideas and opinions. A lot of the things we do have come up as a result of the things that people have shared. So that's wonderful. Um, so I've got handouts for tonight. Let's start talking about it. Can I get a volunteer? Thank you, Don. It's easy tonight. There's only three of them, and they're separate. Oh, we're sure all need here. <laughs> yeah, she texted me. Uh, Put me to work. She texted me before <laughs> class and uh, said she wasn't going to make it today. <laughs> and she is. She's Janine's ride uh, in the evenings. Um, so yeah, so Janine as well. But okay. I just want to share a little, uh, a little quote from a meditation teacher named Go Joseph Goldstein. He's got a few books, uh, one of which I own, and I'm just aware of his teachings. Listen to many of them. He's a great teacher. Uh, he's uh, uh, affiliated with IMS, which is the Insight Meditation Society, um, and also affiliated with Spirit Rock Meditation Center, which is out in California. A lot of wonderful teachers come from that tradition. But this was a little uh, story that he shared and I wanted to share it with you. In India, he says, I was living in a little hut about six feet by seven feet. It had a canvas flap instead of a door. I was sitting on my bed meditating and a cat wandered in and plopped down on my lap. I took the cat and tossed it out the door. Ten seconds later, it was back on my lap. We got into a sort of dance, this cat and I. I tossed it out because I was trying to meditate to get enlightened, but the cat kept returning. I was getting more and more irritated, more and more annoyed with the persistence of the cat. Finally, after about a half hour of this coming in and tossing out, I had to surrender. There was nothing else to do. There was no way to block off the door. So I sat there, the cat came back in and it got in my lap, but I did not do anything. I just let go. 30 seconds later, the cat got up and walked out. So you see, our teachers come in many forms. I just thought that was kind of a cool story. Finally accepting, and then we get the lesson. So. Well, tonight uh, I want to share what I think is a really interesting topic and a really helpful topic. I have talked about this in different ways at previous times, but 
We're going to talk tonight about proliferation, mental proliferation and conceptual proliferation. And this sounds like maybe a kind of a complicated technical topic, but it's actually quite simple to understand and it's quite intuitive, but it's really powerful. It's really helpful. This kind of focuses down on how it is that uh, dukkha uh, begins to generate in our lives. Dukkha, of course, is the Pali word that we use for, most often we use that word for suffering, but dukkha can also just mean unhappiness, it can mean dis-ease, it can mean dissatisfaction, it can mean anxiety. So it really covers a wide spectrum of uh, emotional and mental and physical states, but all of them are towards the um, the, the suffering end of the spectrum, the discomfort, the disease end of the spectrum. So this teaching is really helpful because it gives us some insight into what's going on that uh, starts to generate that uh, mental and conceptual proliferation. So um, I'll start uh, I'll start to read from the text here and again feel free to uh, interject at any time with questions or comments or experiences. Um, those are always appreciated. So, for a person who doesn't practice mindfulness, and for many of us who do, the process of mental proliferation runs on autopilot, nonstop, often in the background of consciousness, so we're really not aware of it as it's taking place. The Pali word for this mental and conceptual proliferation is papancha. I've used that word fairly regularly, so you may be familiar with that. Uh, so papancha, usually translated as mental proliferation. And the insidious thing about papancha is that it self-perpetuates. It is, it's kind of stories building upon stories, building upon stories and so it generates its own fuel so it can run indefinitely um, it can run indefinitely until we embrace it with mindfulness and then we can move uh, work with it in a skillful way to change it uh, papancha or mental proliferation is the process by which much of our suffering arises so this is an important thing to be aware of and it's an important thing to understand and take a deep look into because we can really get some direct and immediate relief from it. And this has really been the case with me. You know, I've been practicing meditation for many, many years and still I'm a human being and so still I'm prone to this um, proliferation of papancha, you know, where I'll just, I'll get a little mental story going and then that thread just kind of keeps, you know, it, it branches into something else and into something else and into something else. And I'll realize after a period of time where I let that go unchecked that I feel really, you know, lousy. I feel really worried. I feel really bummed out or upset or I'm convinced that things are really going wrong, you know. Um, so this is an important one. It, it, it happens to all of us, whether we're experienced in practice or not. Um, so to be aware of it makes us be able to, to, to notice it and then work with it as soon as possible. So that's great. The sooner we work with it, the sooner we recognize it and work with it, the less suffering there is. You know, so it's a, it's a wonderful thing. So. To backtrack a little bit, and this is kind of basic uh, Buddhist 101, we know that attachment is at the root of all unhappiness. So it's like the first noble truth is there is suffering, that there is dukkha, there is, there is this dukkha, this unsatisfactoriness, this suffering. That's the first noble truth. That it happens to everybody. Everybody experiences it. It's not the only thing we experience. Life is not just dukkha. There's a lot of love. There's a lot of laughter. There's a lot of wonderful things in life. But there's also a lot of dukkha, a lot of suffering that overshadows much of the joy that we experience. And incidentally, this time of year for a lot of folks, it's a real time where that happens. You know, the holidays a lot of times are just sort of, they're emotionally charged. They can be difficult and challenging. Um, you know, sometimes there's sort of a 
sort of a sadness, a longing for the way it used to be, you know, the way it used to feel at one point in time around the holidays. Sometimes there are um, people in the family that we don't interact with a whole lot and so then we're exposed to them around the holidays and so there can be some conflicts and some disagreements and so you know it's a tough time of year for a lot of people so that's another reason that I wanted to talk about this tonight because a lot of this papancha um, you know in my own experience can kind of be uh, around these feelings that we have around the holidays so Again, we know that attachment is at the root of all unhappiness or all dukkha. Um, and just here's little ways where that manifests. Not getting what you want. Now, for the word dukkha, I, I use different words for it quite often just to kind of give the spectrum. Tonight I'm just going to use unhappiness for a while. So not getting what you want results in unhappiness. Losing what you want to keep results in unhappiness. Getting what you don't want results in unhappiness. Worrying about the future results in unhappiness. Regretting or longing for the past results in unhappiness. Wanting the present moment to be other than it is results in unhappiness. Or dissatisfaction or disease or agitation uh, anguish, suffering, any of those other words, they all apply. So let's look at how attachment arises through papancha. So incidentally, everything I read there, the not getting what I want, the losing, the getting, the what you don't want, etc., etc., these are all manifestations of attachment as they show up in our lives. Manifestations of craving, uh, um, aversion, uh, these our attachment, the causes of suffering. So let's look at how this arises in the mind through papancha. There is a sutta, it's called the Honey Ball Sutta. And um, what I did, it's a fairly long sutta, and so I just put in some of the key verses from it in here, but I'll give you a little bit of the intro of it. Um, it's the uh, Madhapindaka Sutta, and that means the honey ball sutta. So I'll just read you kind of the introduction. Um, this is the way many of the suttas are uh, start. There's kind of a traditional format to them. It says, Thus I have heard, on one occasion, the Buddha uh, was in the Sakyan country of Kapalavatu. Uh, this is in northern, northern India, near what is now Nepal. Uh, at that time it was morning and the Buddha was taking his bowl uh, and outer robe and went out into Kapalavatu for alms. So he begged, you know, he begged for his food. This was the tradition. And when he had wandered for alms in Kapalavatu, he had returned from his alms round and then after he ate his meal, whatever was given to him by the people that he saw, uh, he went into the great woods uh, for the day's abiding. So he would sit under a tree um, and uh, uh, sit in meditation, and that would be his practice. He would sit in meditation for the day, and then that would be interspersed by, he would give different teachings to the people that would come. So uh, this individual showed up named Dandapani, and uh, while well, he was out walking for exercise, uh, in the woods and he went to uh, where the Buddha had been sitting and exchanged greetings with him and when this courteous and amiable talk was finished he stood at one side leaning on his stick and asked the Blessed One, the Buddha, uh, what does the recluse assert? What does he proclaim? And these are kind of harsh words to speak to somebody of the Buddha's statute, or stature, excuse me, uh, during those days. So he was kind of challenging him. He was throwing out a challenge. Interestingly, the word pundit, where if we watch CNN or uh, MSNBC or Fox News or any of those, 
there'll be political shows on and they always bring in pundits, which are people who are typically experts on kind of one position or the other, and the pundits will argue their side uh, and they'll essentially try to win the argument, right? They'll try and best the others in the argument. That's what a pundit is. Well, that word comes from uh, uh, pandit or pandita in uh, Pali, and so it has its roots in these spiritual uh, debates where one person would go to another spiritual teacher and essentially challenge them to a, uh, to a debate you know, about what it was they're teaching and they can see who would win. And so that was Dandapani's intention, was to kind of put the Buddha on, uh, you know, to, to back him into a corner, get him to answer some questions, and he was going to come back and see if he could best him. So that was, uh, so that was a question. What does the recluse assert? What does he proclaim? So kind of snarky as he says this. And uh, so to him... You know, we're back on the bottom of page one, um, so it's verse four there. Uh, the Buddha said to him, Friend, I teach in such a way that one does not quarrel with anyone in the world. Don't quarrel with anyone in the world. So he kind of deflated him right then and there. He just said, I'm not, I'm not going to debate you. I teach that we don't quarrel with anyone in the world and that no perceptions underlie someone who is free from craving. Okay, so that's an important statement because we know that craving is the cause of suffering. Craving and aversion are part of attachment. Craving is the cause of suffering. And he says no perceptions underlie someone who is free of craving. So we'll get into this a little further and kind of explain what this means. On page uh, two of the handout, let me read a little further from the original text. Read. So when the Buddha said this to Dandapani, uh, Dandapani shook his head, wagged his tongue, and raised his eyebrows until his forehead was puckered in three lines. Then he departed, leaning on his stick. So I just thought it was funny that they, they went into detail describing the facial expressions on this guy after the Buddha had said that, because he kind of just deflated him, and he also kind of took the football away and just said, you know, uh, the game is over. I'm not going to play with you. So I just thought that was kind of funny. Incidentally, we have the ability to do that with people in a tactful way. Sometimes people come to us and we know... They're kind of trying to uh, get us to bite on something and, you know, maybe get us angry or get us, did you know about this? Did you know about that? Did you know about what she said, what he did? You know, sometimes it gets to bite on this stuff. And sometimes it's helpful to remember that, you know, that our practice teaches um, that we don't quarrel with anyone in the world. We don't quarrel with anyone in the world. Sometimes that's helpful to remember. So um, before we continue in the text, I want to get into what are known as the five aggregates and just review them. Um, some of you probably know them from prior teachings or from reading on your own, but uh, there are what are known as the five aggregates, the five skandhas as they're called in Pali. And what these are known as is sort of the five aspects of the human experience that can be sort of identified individually and that our experiences tend to follow these five um, and that they can be observed. And so the five aggregates, the first one is a physical aggregate and the rest are mental. So the first one is form. So form is anything that we can see with the eyes or smell with the nose or touch with the hands or hear with the ears, or taste with the tongue. I'm not sure if I'm repeating. Um, and also, anything we can think about uh, with the mind. Um, because at some point we see a form, you know, you can, you can imagine it. You've seen an apple before. So I could say, okay, imagine an apple. And so you can think of an apple, and so there it is, almost real, right? So, um, 
So mind is considered a, a, a way of experiencing form as well. The next one is consciousness or cognition. Um, at some point when the ears make contact with a sound wave, what we experience is consciousness of hearing, hearing consciousness. If I was to put a morsel of food in my mouth, uh, that form would be making contact with my tongue and taste buds and there would be taste consciousness as a result. So um, the next uh, in the line is feeling. We could also use the word sensation and we practice every week with sensation so we're familiar with that with what that means. But so if you have uh, a form and it makes contact with one of your sense faculties, uh, there is uh, contact there and the result is feeling. There'll be some sort of a feeling. And for feeling, we categorize these into three broad categories. Uh, they can be either pleasant feelings, they can be unpleasant feelings, or they can be neither pleasant nor unpleasant, neutral feelings. Okay? So, we experience those feelings and what follows next is perception. Perception is like the identification part of the process. Up until now, it's pretty much just been bare experience or kind of raw contact. The sense data comes in, the mind is conscious of it, we're experiencing it uh, through our different sense faculties, it's creating sensations or feelings. And then perception comes in and it tells us what that is, you know. So if you were to, um, let's just say you were blindfolded and somebody gave you a strawberry and you put it in your mouth and you started to eat the strawberry, oh, you'd have that, that flavor and that uh, tactile sensation of the strawberry and you would know, oh, that's a strawberry, right? There would be that perception, that identification. Uh, or a piece of chocolate. You put that chocolate morsel in your mouth, you didn't know what it was, but you put it in there and from the texture and from the way it melts and from the flavor and all of that, you're identifying it. Uh, there's these feelings. If you like chocolate, the feeling is pleasant. And if you're allergic to chocolate, the feeling is unpleasant. Um, but then there's this perception, oh, that's chocolate. You know, and it goes on and on with all the different types of feelings that you can have. Following that, there's usually a reaction of some sort. And this is the papancha part. This is where we start to mentally proliferate. Because we get all that sense data coming in, and then we start to work with it. Um, this is where the stories start to be generated. This is where the, um, the internal narrative starts and we start to kind of branch out into sometimes really elaborate uh, types of stories. So I'll pick up with uh, number 16 here, verse 16. <clears throat> and again, I kind of I edited this out. There's a lot of sort of descriptive text about who was there and what they said and kind of, you know, some of the formalities of it. So I tried to get right down to kind of the nitty gritty here. So what he says now is that dependent on the eye and forms, eye consciousness arises. So this is why I wanted to explain those five aggregates first so you kind of had an understanding of what we're talking about here. So depending on the eye and forms, eye consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. Okay, so there's the eye, there's form, and then there's the consciousness of those, and the meeting of those three is contact. With contact as condition, there is feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates. With what one has mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a person with respect to past, future, and present forms cognizable through the eye. So to paraphrase this a little bit, 
you can see that we're following in order the five aggregates the way they're written. This verse is following along with those five aggregates. And so really what it's saying is, you see something and there's eye consciousness. Um, and we just call the meaning of that, it's contact. You know, I have contact, I have visual contact, right, with the chair in front of me. So that's, um, uh, so that's contact. With contact with, uh, as a condition, there's a feeling. I might look at that chair, it might be neutral to me, it might be pleasant, it might be unpleasant, uh, right? So these chairs to me, mm, many of them are, you know, fairly neutral, but they have overall sort of a pleasant connotation because they're the chairs in the meditation hall and that's kind of a nice feeling, right? If I was involved in a stream of papancha right now, I might say, well, there's a lot of empty chairs in this room tonight and that's kind of scary and I don't know what's going on. Did I say something last time that made people mad or, you know what I mean? This is typical papancha. You, you, you take something that you see and you start to make stories about it. So it's an interesting thing to be aware of. Um, so we see things, uh, so there's that sensory contact. Uh, what one feels, one perceives, okay, you know, that's the chair, I have a good feeling about it, I'm identifying it. With, uh, with one, um, with what one perceives, that one thinks about. So I perceive that this is a chair, and then I start to think about it. So there's that reaction. Oh, it's a meditation room chair, it's a nice thing, you know. It's an empty chair, I wish they were full, not so nice thing. Or... Yeah, chairs, whatever, neutral thing. So um, what one has mentally, with what one has mentally proliferated as the source, new perceptions and notions born of that mental proliferation beset a person. And in this context, the Pali word that we translated into perset, beset means that they cause you to suffer they will agitate you, they'll make you anxious, they'll make you worried. In some way, these are states of consciousness that are difficult to endure or unpleasant to experience, right? So in other words, we get worried about it or we get uptight about it or we can't stop thinking about, oh man, what if this bad thing's gonna happen? You know, I'm really dreading that. Um, right? But that happens so often and so automatically. So it's really neat that this is all broken down into a very clear process that we can look at how it takes place and gain some insight into what's going on. And of course, once we have insight into what's going on, then we can do something to make it better. We can do something to free ourselves from this pattern. And this is very much of a pattern um, sometimes we use the word ignorance, right, to talk about um, like uh, the root, uh, unwholesome roots, the three unwholesome roots, one of them being ignorance or delusion or confusion. Um, this would be a good example of ignorance in this case. Again, nothing to do with a person's intelligence. You could be absolutely a genius, but if you're not aware of this process going on, then According to the teachings, that's what's considered ignorance. It's just you didn't know. You didn't know that this was going on. And because you didn't know, you weren't able to act on it. You weren't able to do anything with it. And so that's what ignorance is. It's just, oh, you didn't know. You didn't know. Sometimes we don't want to know. And then we call that delusion. Uh, because it's more of an intentional, I don't know and I don't want to know. I don't want to deal with this. So... Um, all right, so I hope that makes sense. Um, boy, oh boy, we're at 828 here, uh, which is just like amazing. Um, so I wonder if we should leave it here, just because if I go into the next paragraph, you know, I, I, I'm not really going to have the ability to explain it to you. What I would suggest is if you want to read through the rest of this handout, um, it's interesting stuff. 
at least i think so and if you found what we've talked about so far interesting what we'll talk about next week then is how do we get freedom from all this stuff and there's a very practical very hands on way to do it and then i've got another teaching in the back which is sort of a here's something you can do if you're in trouble uh, like if you're having sort of an anxiety attack or a panic attack or you're finding it difficult to kind of stop the papancha in its tracks. I've shared this one before, but it's so helpful. Uh, from time to time, I like to share it again, especially because we get new people coming in who have not heard it, and that's the practice on stop. So we'll do that one next week also. Um, and so we'll pick up with... Uh, I'm leaving off right after, I'm on number 16, and I'm leaving off after, well, what is essentially the first full paragraph there uh, with respect to future and past, future, and present forms cognizable through the eye. So that's where I'm going to mark that we're leaving off, and we'll pick up, pick up next week. Uh, with that. So I hope you're all able to come back so we can get this because uh, this is good stuff but sometimes they take a little longer than one session. My goodness that went fast. Goodness gracious it did. So all right before we leave uh, let's just do our quick practice of the four Brahma Viharas. So very very important. We do this last and we only spend about a minute on it but I'll tell you um, in my own life, uh, until I started to really practice compassion and loving kindness uh, to the point where it became a real thing for me, I had difficulty really making progress on the path. You know, at first it was kind of like, well, just give me the serene, quiet mind. You know, give me kind of the Give me the samurai version of this where I've just kind of, I got the stuff that can make me tough and kind of invincible and imperturbable. Uh, but, you know, maybe some other day I'll work on the love and the kindness and the, the joy and those sorts of things. But this is transformational. Um, to be able to cultivate uh, compassion, loving kindness, appreciative joy and equanimity. I mean, this is just at the core of the practice practice, excuse me. So, so very important, so beneficial. And when you walk out of here, this is kind of the tone you're carrying, you know? So this is just beautiful. All right, so together, you try to feel with this, this with your heart as much as you can, really feel it in your heart. And we'll begin with, we have an awareness that there are beings in this world who are suffering, right? All kinds of beings who are suffering. Some of them suffering innocently. Some people suffer because they do things uh, that cause them to suffer. They are, you know, causing themselves difficulty. What we do here is we don't bring judgment to it and we don't differentiate between why one person suffers and another person suffers. We just say we recognize that there are beings in this world and in this universe who suffer. And with great compassion we say, May you be free from suffering and from the causes of suffering. This is our great wish of compassion. And may you be free from, uh, or may you be surrounded by love and kindness. Excuse me. So in addition to may you be free from suffering and the causes of suffering, may you be surrounded by love and kindness. Again, no differentiation between who deserves what. May you be surrounded by love and kindness. May you be joyful and happy. And may you be equanimous, peaceful and free. And at a place where you are not uh, beset by attachment, by craving, by clinging and aversion. So this is real peace. And especially to you sharing this room with me tonight, to whom I'm always so grateful to, and I just love to share this time and the teaching of the Dhamma with you. To you who share this room with me tonight, may you be truly, 
truly happy. Blessings. Blessings. Be well. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And have a wonderful week ahead. Wonderful week ahead. And remember, you sure don't have to rush off. You're welcome to hang out here, read stuff. I recently subscribed to Bodhidharma Magazine and to Lions Row Magazine. So once I start getting those, I'll be getting those regularly so people can read those out in the, in the community room and trying to get more and more resources each time just to make things a little more, uh, a little more helpful, a little more appealing. Good night, Don. Take care. Drive careful. Good night, Norma. Thanks so much for coming. Oh... So the size is still just kind of doing the trick for you. It's really nice. Well, that's awesome. Yeah.